I, I cannot uh, address this issue uh, as it pertains to little girls growing up. But for little boys growing up, there will come a time always that sooner or later, you're going to get into a bragging party with your buddies. Now, when that usually turns is when you, you start bragging about something and then somebody plays the ultimate card and enters in the bragging about their dad. My dad is faster than your dad. Uh, my dad is smarter than your dad. Or my dad makes more money than your dad. One such story was told about a group of boys bragging about that. And the first one said, well, my dad definitely makes more money than the rest of you. My dad scribbles some words on a page. He calls it a poem and makes a hundred bucks. The second kid says, that's nothing. My dad scribbles some words on a piece of paper and he calls it a prescription. It makes $500. They turn to the third boy and he's sitting over there yawning like, you know, guys, really? Is that the best you can do? He said, my dad scribbles some words on a piece of paper and calls it a sermon. It takes eight people to carry out the money every Sunday in plates. <laughs> no matter what kids end up bragging about for boys, I guarantee you at some point or another though, it does come down to this, that they begin to say, my dad is stronger than your dad. And then it enters into this contest of verbiage about all that. I think in some ways, just saying that as a kid would help a kid. It would have helped me feel like um, my dad is there to protect me, that no matter what, he's stronger than everybody else. And so he can make sure that no matter what, I'm going to be okay. It's such a great thing when kids brag on their dads. Can you imagine with me today what it must have been like thousands of years ago if Jesus started bragging about his dad or dads or dads. You see, we're on a journey this Advent season in terms of the four Sundays prior to Christmas and we're preparing, we're working our way towards Christmas Day when we can actually uh, celebrate the, the giving of the gift, the birth of baby Jesus. And to help us on this journey, this year we've been looking at the preparation through a hymn in our hymn books entitled, What Child Is This? Written all the way back in 1856 by William Chatterson Dix. And the hymn poses the question in the title, talking about baby Jesus. What child is this? And in the midst of that, it then goes on in the four verses of the hymn that follow, uh, the attempt to try to answer that question. And as you know, it, it reverts back to the scene of the manger and talks about in the hymn those who were present. Obviously, baby Jesus. We have Mary, the mother of Jesus. At that point mentioned also in the hymn, uh, there's references to the shepherds, the angels, and even uh, there's two mentions of livestock. Um, even, they even include the wise men who aren't there at that moment but are yet to come bringing gifts in the hymn. And when you read through it, you feel so great. But if you have a sharp eye, you begin to look back through there and do a checklist. Guess who's missing? Somebody is notably absent. Somebody is missing. Somebody really, I would suggest, is pretty doggone important to this whole story and answering the question of what child is this. But he's not in the hymn. His name is Joseph. That's right. He's not mentioned by name. He's not referred to by any action. But apparently the hymn writers understood that that's pretty much in keeping with biblical precedent. Because even in the gospel of Mark, Joseph is not mentioned at all. The gospel of Mark. Jesus' daddy is not mentioned. And even in Matthew, Luke, and John, though they mention Joseph, he doesn't have any speaking parts. Well, you and I know that in any drama that unfolds, you're not really important if you don't have a what? A speaking part. But I want to suggest to you, here's the thing. Joseph was present before the manger. Joseph was present at the manger. And Joseph was present after. At the manger and after the manger. So there before, at and after. Joseph is in, inextricably tied in this story. Scholars believe that uh, they can trace some understanding that 
uh, after Jesus was a teenager that Joseph died somewhere after Jesus was a teenager until the time Jesus came, became about 30 years old when he started his public ministry. Joseph died somewhere in there. And Matthew says, tells us he was a righteous man. Uh, as a matter of fact, they go on to describe why. Because he wanted to show compassion to Mary, his betrothed, his fiance. That even when he found out she became pregnant, he wanted to show compassion and put her away quietly. Not, now, when I say put her away, I'm not talking about whacking her. I'm talking about not marrying her, divorcing her quietly. So as not to bring shame on her. So he's a man of compassion. We know that Joseph was uh, a believer. He believed in God and was... Uh, responding uh, obediently to God uh, because we understand uh, many of us would have chosen to have been practical in that day and time and gotten as far away from that scene as we could. I mean, let, let's try to wrap our minds around that for just a moment. The, the word has gone out that we're betrothed. I'm going to get married. I have a fiance. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And then I bring word, well, she's pregnant. Wait, wait, wait. She, the, the child is not mine. Come again? And not only is the child not mine, it belongs to God. Can you? I can't. I cannot. We cannot even begin to imagine the emotional cutoff that Joseph must have experienced from his friends, from his neighbors, those who would have respected him. Maybe it would have even affected his business. He was a carpenter by trade. Maybe even those who would have normally come to him and asked him to build something would have said, guys, what? We're not going to be a part of that story. But in the midst of this, Joseph was righteous and compassionate and obedient to God. Even following the birth of Jesus, we understand King Herod had heard word that the wise men were traveling towards this uh, to, to find the, the, the birth of a new king. King Herod said, what new king? Well, we're going to find him. And King Herod said, well, I'll tell you what, when you find him, let me know and I'll come worship too. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Herod was out to kill him. Herod did not want any competition at that point. Well, the amazing thing is, Joseph had an opportunity to abandon Jesus because he had heard the edict that went out from King Herod. You know what? Just go ahead and kill every baby under the age of two, every male infant. That way I don't have to worry about whether or not we get the right one. We will have gotten all of them. Now, Joseph could have abandoned Jesus at that moment. He could have abandoned his original plans of marriage. He could have absconded, but instead, he takes full responsibility for Jesus and for Mary. He stops at nothing to protect his, his family, even to the point of relocating his work, uh, his family, his life to Egypt. Uh, and Joseph chooses, actually, to become a refugee in order to protect Jesus, to protect his adopted son. To protect, we might even say, his foster son. Joseph was a godly man. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here because we must begin by acknowledging that Jesus is a child adopted by a father who loved him. Even though he wasn't the biological father of him. We know this to be true from Scripture in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew in the first chapter. Hear this story again as if you've never heard it. Chapter 1 beginning with verse 18. Because this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph was her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace... He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins." Now, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. 
Here's the story. Joseph, the adoptive father, the adoptive dad. Before he's even fully married his wife, because we're told in Scripture they've not consummated physically their marriage, he becomes, he is willing to become the adoptive father of this son. Before he has met this child to be entrusted to his care, he takes on the role of adopted dad. Having multiple opportunities to abscond, to escape, to get out of this, whether quietly or loudly, before the reality of even holding this baby in his arms, Joseph, out of his goodness, chooses to be obedient and to take care of Mary and to be there for his child. We have no indication in Scripture that Joseph made any kind of fuss. Rather, he publicly identifies not only with Mary, but his new baby boy that he was not responsible for, but totally responsible for. In Matthew 1, 21, it says, The angel of the Lord told Joseph in that dream, She will bear a son, and you are to give him the name. And so that was the custom in that day, that you take your baby and you place it on the father's lap. And by naming the child, you are saying you are bringing legitimacy to this birth. Legitim legitimacy to the family name. In other words, at that moment, Joseph was all in. He was saying, this is my baby boy. I am going to be responsible for him. And we understand he became the parent. He was known as Jesus' daddy. We look back in Scripture and you fast forward to the time when, when Mary and, and Joseph and Jesus had traveled to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. He was around 12 years old. Uh, they, they enjoy the celebration. They're headed back and they somehow get separated. They, mom and dad turn around, Joseph and Mary, and where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And they hightail it as they, any panicked parent would do. Back to the scene of when they first recognized he was gone. Eventually they discover him, uh, you know, in, in the temple, uh, sharing about scripture with the authorities there. But when faced there, Mary says, or this is what's said in scripture in Luke 2, and when his parents saw him, parents saw him. They were so astonished and his mother said to him, son, why have you treat us, treated us so? Behold, your father, looking at Joseph, calling him by name, this title, your father and I've been searching for you in great distress. Both the Bible and Mary clearly recognize the adoptive father of Jesus. He is all in. John's gospel provides even more compelling clues regarding Joseph adopting Jesus as his own when he says in John 1 45, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the one the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, here comes the title, the son of Joseph. Even later when they were accusing Jesus of saying, You're, there's no way you could be the Messiah, the religious elder said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? So everybody recognizes, if you will, this natural bond, this adoptive fostering parental relationship that Joseph has with his boy, as he might be known, recognized as Joseph's son. So let's go back to the question. What child is this? I would answer it in this way. The same way Joseph adopted Jesus what child is this? He is the one that takes you and he takes me and he takes all who are willing and he places them on his lap and he names them. He adopts them. He adopts you, he adopts me into his family. It was foreordained in Galatians 4.4 4 when it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born under the law. Listen to the description so that we might receive adoption as sons. It talks about us being heirs to the throne, heirs to the fullness of what Christ does for us. What child is this? He is the one who makes your adoption, my adoption, into his family possible. That adoption we know leads to salvation, uh, which is the, the being out of the entire presence of sin or the penalty of sin or the power of sin by having known Jesus Christ as our adoptive father. You remember when the angel told Joseph, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you will name him Jesus. Why? 
for He will save people. He will save people from their sins. What child is this? I want you to hear this. This is Jesus, the son of Joseph, his adoptive father, who does for us what Joseph did for him, putting his life on the line. He takes us as his own. He's the adopting father. He places us on his lap. He names us. He claims us. He desires to be our father, to protect us, to love us, to grow us, to mature us. He enables us to be his family. So if I bring all of that down to, to, to my life right now, where, where I am in the midst of all this, my dad, Lee Stocks Jr., showed me how to love people right where they are. He was teaching me all about belonging. Lee Stocks Jr. reminded me as his boy I would always be in process, always be maturing. I'll never reach the point of full maturity. I didn't know it. He was teaching me about becoming. But wait a minute. I have another father, a foster father who adopted me. His name is Jesus. He accepted me just as I am. That really feels like belonging to me. And when he accepted me, he said, I'm going to move into your life and I'm going to help you start to look like me. That sounds strangely like becoming to me. I don't know about you, but that sounds like something worth bragging about. And I don't guess I could say to any other believer, my dad is stronger than your dad. Because if you believe, we have the same father who just happens to be the creator of the universe. That is what child is this. Pray with me. Father, for all of us in this moment who desire to find peace in our hearts and lives, not, not, not just the absence of conflict, but peace. Described in the word shalom, a, a fullness, a wholeness that we understand we are in the lap of God, our Heavenly Father who has chosen us and named us with the family name, Christian. So may we find our way into the hands of our Father at this moment. And for everyone who has never made that leap, may they leap now to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior to join the family, to become an heir, to become an adopted son and daughter of Jesus Christ. That we may all know peace together. Find us faithful in these moments, O oh God, for so many of us have heard these old, old stories and know them well. And yet I pray you would come and disturb us Convict us, give us the nudge of your Holy Spirit, the pneuma nudge that says whatever your Holy Spirit needs to say to each of us in this moment. I pray you will find us faithful to listening, to hearing, and to responding. I say this to you, O God, in closing. Thank you. Thank you for taking me as your own. And I want to give my life to bragging on you. Amen.